you ever start one of these uh, YouTube videos and rapidly discover you don't have a whole lot to say to people? Uh, I enjoy playing with the technology. I like um, the fact that what I got going on here is a Hero 4 black camera I got, oh, yesterday, tried to take it on the road on my bike, learning how to make it work. Um, right now, I'm looking at myself doing this video. Actually, I'm cut off at the head. Let me move that a little bit. Uh, watching myself on this little uh, screen here. This is my iPhone running a Go, the GoPro app. Interestingly, what they've got is um, both the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth connection going simultaneously. I guess they can't send the video over the Bluetooth for some reason. Maybe the bandwidth is too, too low. I find that hard to believe, but it, they pair to use the, uh, the Wi-Fi for the video stream and the Bluetooth for the control only. Uh, so in order to make this work, you've got to get the Bluetooth channel set up right and you've got to get the Wi-Fi set up right. And frequently they go out of sync and you can sit here pushing buttons till the cows come home and nothing uh, to no avail. Um, anyway, let's get to the heart of what I'm trying to do here. I've been watching these videos from the pros. Um, you got Tom Lipton, you got Adam Booth, Keith Fenner who has been doing this sort of thing. I guess since YouTube started, he's got so many videos. He's probably, probably got the equivalent of a year of lifetime on video. Um, basically uh, taking you through uh, his individual uh, projects that he does for a living. Uh, it's amazing. If you came to my shop where I work and set up a camera, uh, I'm not sure anybody could watch it for longer than 30 seconds um, because you'd basically be watching nothing nor me sitting in front of a screen talking to people uh, on the phone and watching WebEx. Uh, even though it is a pretty exciting industry to be in, uh, there's no nothing visible unless you're into designing electronics, which is uh, which brings me to my background. I'm an electrical engineer by schooling, uh, been in the software business for 35 years, and I have no business to be around these tools. Um, and that explains why I'm here, because uh, I generally like to try things that uh, I'm no good at in order to improve. Uh, let's face it, if you just kept doing things you're good at, um, life would be a little bit less interesting. Uh, so uh, what happened was some years ago, uh, back in 2010, I found myself uh, with some time on my hands when my startup company tanked. And uh, with the uh, uh, subprime mortgage downturn, I had nothing to do for a couple months. And uh, my wife convinced me to build uh, these things. And it's kind of hard to see back here because this is a very cluttered garage. All right, what you're looking at here, if I can, yeah, there we go, get it. Are two uh, dual resonant solid state Tesla coils powered by um, CM300 IGBTs. Uh, we'll take those out at some point and video them later. Um, but that they serve to uh, illustrate why I'm here and why I have all these machines in my garage instead of a car. My poor car, which lives outside now for the last four years because all this stuff's in here. Anyway, these Tesla coils are capable, these Tesla coils are capable of projecting a 13 foot lightning bolt that plays music. Now, in order to do that, there are all sorts of technology you got to learn and master, and all sorts of physical machining skills and craftsman skills that you got to master. And I'm not sure I've mastered any of it, uh, but it was fun building these things. And along the way, I came to the conclusion that uh, I was going to have to have a lathe, at least, and perhaps a mill to make some of the parts for these uh, for these machines. Uh, again, I'll take those out later, and it is my objective at some point in these videos, if I make more than just this one, uh, to show exactly how I went about uh, building these things. Because you, well, you can go out and buy a kit um, from uh, like Eastern Technology Resources, Dan. Uh, you can't buy a kit to build a big one. And uh, unless you understand the principles behind it, uh, you basically um, not going to even get close. These things are dangerous. They're dangerous to build. The voltages involved will kill you. 
so it's not for the faint of heart, although um, it's also not for the uh, people who go in foolishly. Uh, these things work, and uh, although I haven't used them since uh, 2012, when I uh, went on this particular contrivance, I did an endo, busted my collarbone, and wound up with a titanium plate in my shoulder. As you know, titanium is a metal. Tesla coils uh, emit an EM field, and uh, my concern was that the titanium plate in my shoulder would heat up due to the eddy currents formed by the EM emitted by the Tesla coils, thereby causing me, well, at the minimum, a whole lot of pain and at the very worst, bursting into flames. I decided to stop using the Tesla coils. However, uh, one of the things that I do, and my wife does, is we take part, I don't know if you can see this sign here. We take part every year in uh, the Maker Fair. And uh, the Maker Fair uh, hosts a group of, oh, a couple hundred, uh, couple hundred uh, inventors and designers and builders of all types all over the Bay Area. And actually, at this point, I think they have over 100 Maker Fairs year-round uh, year uh, all over the world, from China to Europe and in numerous states in the, in the U.S. We take part in the one in the Bay Area here. And, um, and so um, uh, we're building things. We're continuously building things. Uh, I built these Tesla coils behind my uh, chop saw here. Uh, you can see covered up a nice uh, Van de Graaff generator that's capable of generating about, oh, 775 kilovolts uh, static. The Tesla coils are, of course, a dynamic uh, electric uh, uh, emitter. The Van de Graaff, it creates a static field, which does some pretty interesting things. You know, you've seen it, uh, your hair, makes your hair stand up, that kind of thing. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, wife and I are technology junkies. And uh, so, in the course of building these Tesla coils, uh, what we wound up doing was realizing that we needed to uh, have some machine tools to create the parts we needed for the coils. And therefore, I bought this grizzly lathe right here. I feel like I should have an assistant, uh, you know, like uh, on Let's Make a Deal or uh, or The Price is Right. Carol, show them the lathe. There it is. This is a Grizzly two thousand and uh, four thousand and two, a very low end uh, but nice lathe. Uh, I've upgraded it tremendously over the years. Uh, the things that are stock parts on it are the things that I couldn't easily swap out. Like, you know, all the internal gearing is still the same. Never replaced the bearings, although I thought about it. Um, this chuck is a uh, is an 8-inch gator chuck. I couldn't afford the bison. I went for the gator. Uh, I need the need the uh, it to be able to expand to the Point where I could put a uh, larger tubing, like a six-inch tube or seven-inch tube, in it to uh, to bring down the OD for some of the coils. Uh, let's see. I've modified it so that um, it's got a three-phase Leeson motor, and it came with a, a two-phase Chinese motor, uh, or rather a, a single-phase 220 Chinese motor. I've got a three-phase Leeson in there now. Um, I've got a, a, a VFD Tico VFD. So I can make it run backwards, and I have a continuous speed spread on it. Um, and so that's the lathe. Uh, over there, I've got a mill, and uh, also somewhat modified by me. Uh, it's a, uh, I guess, a Rong Fu 45 knockoff, although it's not a knockoff. It's actually probably made a lot better than the knockoffs uh, by the, the guys up on the East Coast. Uh, the industrial hobbies people who have changed their name to Charter Oak at this point, I believe. Uh, it's an IHCNC 12Z manual mill. It's not, it's not uh, CNC'd, although one project I want to do at some point is to CNC it. Uh, you can see the Tico uh, VFD that I used to uh, change the speed, forward and reverse. I've, I've added my own... Uh, run stop uh, controls, emergency stop, etc. 
And I've got uh, made from spare parts that I had laying around. I've got a uh, uh, up down uh, motor control because I was tired of reaching back there and doing the cranks. So in fact, uh, I can raise it and lower it with the use of a little induction motor I had laying around the house. So uh, at any rate, to make this video a little bit more useful, uh, what I'll show you is what I did here uh, to, well, let me take, let's go around the back. To reproduce something I saw in one of Tom Lipton's videos. So if you look on Tom's videos, uh, I believe in one of his, uh, one of his Monday meatloaf things, he talks about, he talks about uh, the coolant system he invented. And uh, I saw that and I thought it was really nifty. He's got his uh, hooked up to a, well, what he's got is the shop air coming in, going through a valve. A, a regulator valve into um, a device that he built with a soda bottle. I think he's using some kind of fizzy water soda bottle. And then uh, heading out to a Noga cool uh, coolant uh, mister. And with his setup, the way it's uh, the way it works is you have independent control over the coolant and the air. So you can modify the output of the thing from pure coolant to do a mini flood coolant kind of thing to pure air. Uh, I thought that was pretty neat. And in fact, uh, over here, I'll just quickly head back. Thanks to the, thanks to image stabilization, this might make you seasick, but it's not too awful. Uh, I've done the same thing that he did. Uh, there's a uh, view of the. The, uh, there's the brass head that I machined and this uh, these feed wires with the air and the coolant come up to a Noga cool just like Tom's uh, the Noga cool is actually an easier device to gen up this way than the cool mist and so what I did is I had a Noga cool and a cool mist and I decided to do one of each and uh, so I shall demonstrate if I can do this without getting coolant all over myself and everything else. Well, let's try it. All right, what we got here, we have the shop air. This is something else I can point out at some point. Uh, shop air, so my uh, reservoir is up there in the rafters of the garage and the motor and compressor itself are up there. Uh, put that together some time ago um, there's really no room on the garage floor, floor for the compressor. So uh, let's see, we've got the um, uh, regulator set pretty low. I don't know how much air these uh, or how much pressure uh, a Coke bottle can take. I understand these things can take, you know, 90, 90 PSI or so. Uh, I'm not too keen on that myself. Um, you know, if these things shatter, uh, they can explode with some amazing force, and I know the emergency rooms all over the country are filled with, with people who've been damaged by plastic shrapnel from exploding Coke bottles. You know, the typical thing is some kid puts a, uh, a bit of uh, dry ice into a Coke bottle and seals it, and, uh, and uh, do not try that at home is all I can say. All right, so what we'll do here is I'll show you quickly uh, the operation, I'll tell you how it works, actually, and then maybe what I'll do, and if I ever do another one of these videos, is I'll, uh, I'll show you, uh, this, this brass device is actually very, very simple. All right, so let me pressurize it here. If I'm turning it, there, there we go. All right, so there we go. It's charging up. All right, so what you have here is I've got a fluid line. I've got an air line. The air line can be controlled with either this or this valve right here. And here we see I've just got pure air coming out at the moment. And let me take it up to about 10 or 15 PSI. You don't need much. 
So here we have just air coming out and I'm keeping the flow low because I don't want to make a mess. All right, uh, so I can shut off the air and with the fluid line going into a needle valve here, I can then open that, oh, if I can open it and hold the camera at the same time, there you go. So there you can see I can get just a stream of coolant, which is proceeding to mess everything up. I do not have a sump or a drain on this lathe. It wasn't set up to have one. Um, I'm just simply uh, um, waiting for it to go away and <laughs> wiping it up when it comes out. But there you go. You can probably see it again. So I got pure coolant. So then the other thing you can do, obviously, if I can get pure air and pure coolant, I can turn that bad boy on and I can get a mixture of air and coolant for pure flood. Same thing is possible with the Noga Cool. And uh, the nice thing about the Noga Cool is you don't need to put the needle valve in on the coolant side because they've already got that arrangement set up. Um, you've got uh, uh, individual air and coolant on the Noga already. Uh, so um, the, only, the only different with the cool mist is I had to put this needle valve on. Now, now what exactly is happening here? Okay. So there are four ports in this, uh, in this head. And I wonder if I can do this without creating a giant mess. All right. So air is off, right? We've drained that. Let's get the uh, air is going into the regulator, but nowhere else. Okay. So I'm going to open this up here. And I'll take this guy out and we'll get coolant all over the floor, but that's okay. We'll let it a little drip. All right. I'll put this somewhere where it hopefully won't fall. Right. Got to find a better way to do this camera angle thing so that you can see without. So um, what we have in this head is we have an imp uh, air input coming from the regulator and i don't know if it's visible down there so the air so what i did was i bored the uh brass bored it out to one inch which is basically the width of the of the bottle and i then threaded it uh, eight threads per inch with this tool here and uh, I made this tool after watching Tom's video. Let's see, yeah, you can see that. I uh, made this uh, after watching Tom's video, and basically I just took the bottle and uh, machined the, or ground this bit to fit in the threads of this bottle. This is high-speed steel. Well, actually, it's one of those cobalt high-speed steel bits you get off of uh, you get off eBay. I think they're like five bucks a piece or something like that. So you stand at the wheel grinding for a while. You can see I got a little bit of coloration there and made that tool there. I then um, I looked online for the pitch. Uh, it was very difficult to use a standard thread gauge to figure out what the pitch of this was. Uh, but I tried uh, nine, I tried nine and a half, and eventually eight turned out to be the right number. Uh, however, eight threads per inch, plastic bottle with the brass which I must say my machining technique isn't all that great uh, the uh, the threads came out a little a little chattery so I have to put some uh, uh, Teflon tape around the around the bottle to keep it keep the seal in the integrity of the seal all right so let's see I got my little monitor here, which is the which is the iPhone. Well, you can't really see. I'm gonna shove you guys in there. Um, so what we got is that one inch hole threaded to. Uh, let me put uh, maybe if I put that over there. Uh, I'm not sure you can see it any better. Threaded to eight threads per inch. And uh, and these two ports are air ports. These ports are drilled in and tapped for quarter 
inch pipe thread. And uh, they actually uh, come into the main bore down here. So they actually open up into the main bore. And so air can come in through here and into the soda bottle around the outside of this tube. And then it can also uh, travel outward this way. Now, this tube is uh, connected to a, uh, a quarter inch barb with a quarter inch pipe thread. And there's a hole that comes up through the center that exits out here independently. So as you can see, we, you pressurize through, through here, pressurize the bottle. If the coolant line is closed off, the air has nowhere to go except to escape through this line here. If you open up this valve, if you open up this valve allowing the coolant to flow, uh, then some of that pressure is going to force the liquid through this tube up through the center and out through here. And of course, at the other case, if you close off the air completely, the air that comes in will pressurize the bottle and only liquid will flow out through this tube. And that's how it works. Uh, I don't think Tom did his that way. I'm pretty sure he didn't, in fact. Um, he has a much more sophisticated method of sealing the, his bottle in. I mean, I'm just using a pretty simple Coke bottle with some pipe tape on it. Uh, but it works fine. All right. Well, anyway, that's the first video. I'm trying to show something of value. I'm happy to uh, give some more pictures of this uh, coolant system if anybody's interested. Uh, and thanks a lot. I'm Joe. This is my first video. When I push this button, it stops. <laughs>